So my name is Jonathan Georges. Like I said, I work at a company called Bluehost. Uh, my job is uh, I'm a full-time WordPress contributor, so I'm paid to help the software grow and get better and, and, and go from there. Uh, I'm going to grab my laser pointer, I forgot. All right, so we'll need this later on. Uh, okay. Does anybody know who this is? No? Nobody? This is uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and he said something way back in his day, and uh, it still resonates with me, and so I want to share it today. Uh, and it's really a universal language, and what he said was, dollar, dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> he also said cream, cash rules everything around me. Uh, but we're all here today because we make money on WordPress, or we, we use the internet to you know, pay our bills in some way, or it's our hobby. Um, and users want instant gratification, right? Speed is always a topic, performance, everybody's always got questions about how to make things faster. Um, in our day to day, we, we, we're using our phone and you know, things take too long, we, we put the phone away and we just go do something else. Um, so in our businesses, this translates to, to money. Um, there's many ways to improve your website and your business model and all those things and, and essentially get more money, more cash, um, cash more checks, which we'll talk about. Uh, but basically, I'm, I'm only going to talk about performance. So I'm not going to talk about improving your designs to convert better. I'm not going to talk about um, doing psychological studies on your users and what, what encourages certain behaviors. Um, so this is only a part of the puzzle, performance. So 53% of users on mobile will abandon a website that takes more than three seconds to load. Uh, performance is important to a lot of people. So this person, he has a really nice website, but uh, it takes a long time to load, and he's not getting the conversions that he was hoping for. So he's, he's a frustrated business owner. So we're going to follow his journey through my talk here. Um, so this was a study, and... Basically, the study found that the cognitive stress of a slow-loading website was just as bad as a horror movie. Going to see a horror movie. Who likes horror movies? Anybody? A couple? Brianne, I know you like horror movies. So yeah, don't let this be your website. We don't, you don't want people typing in, you know, jonathandroge.com and this is what's going on in their head. Um, it's spooky. We don't want our website to be spooky. We want everybody to feel welcome. So essentially, if we're going to be dramatic, this is what we're doing if we have a slow website, right? We're just we're burning cash, getting rid of it. We want to be more like this guy. We want to be swimming in our, our money from our website. So, uh, caching. What's caching? This is a very simple uh, definition to a pretty complex topic, which we'll try to boil down. In, in, it's technical, but I'm going to try to make it non-technical for everybody. But it's basically a hardware or a software component that stores data so that requests for data can be served faster in the future. Uh, databases are inefficient, servers are slow, there's connections between the two, between the user's machine. Uh, the machine might be on the other side of the planet and it's got to get all the way over to here in Boston. Um, hardware is expensive. All these things add up to, to frustrations as site owners and things that we have to uh, weigh to come up with the formula that works best for us. Um, so a good analogy uh, is a grocery store. Uh, how many times do you go grocery shopping every week? A few times, maybe twice, once, once, twice, right? So if, if you're the grocery store is your server and your database, uh, every single time you need to eat, you don't want to go to the grocery store. It's super inefficient. It's super time, a waste of time. Uh, it's not always possible. The grocery store is not always open. So you can think of, of your site and your, your server and your database as the grocery store. Caching is the, the form of going to the grocery store, getting the ingredients, and bringing it back to your house. You have it there. It's ready. It's at the ready for you to use to do whatever you need. Um, and it can also be the equivalent of maybe having takeout food or something in the fridge that's already made. Um, and we'll talk about these analogies and what they equate to in, as far as caching is concerned as we go. So I'm going to talk about two types of caching. Uh, the first one is non-persistent caching. Uh, so this one is great because WordPress has this built in. Uh, when I say non-persistent caching, what I mean is 
I go to the site and everything loads. Uh, whatever gets cached on my request is not going to carry over to the next request. Um, so user A, they go to my homepage, and then user B goes, what, what one does will not affect the other. Uh, persistent caching is the opposite, and we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So WordPress has this class, this PHP class built in. And if we look at this code example, basically, uh, you don't have to understand it, but basically what it does is it says i is equal to zero, and while i is less than 100, we're going to get this post from the database, and every time we do it, we're going to increase i by one. So it's going to run about 100 times, and it's, we would think that it would get the post every single time. It would be one database call for each time. Uh, so, but basically, this will only run once. This will only result in one database query because once a post is grabbed from the database, WordPress uses that non-persistent caching to store it, and this all happens right out of the box. If you have a WordPress site, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what hardware or whatever you have on it, WordPress will do this behind the scenes. Um, so this is really great because I could be getting 100 posts, and then I could show uh, my most recent comment on our posts and my most recent posts and I could list the, you know, the top five for each category, uh, but it's only going to get those posts once in every page load. So that's really great. So if we look, if I, I went in and I disabled all this internal caching and I looked at a home page with 20 WordPress posts and it resulted in 66 queries. If I re-enabled this non-persistent caching, it was 45 queries. So right there, WordPress is saving me 33% uh, on my, my number of database queries. And again, this, this all happens without you even knowing it. And this is really easy to take advantage of. Uh, my, thing, uh, my thing died, that's right. But uh, this is an example where, um, this is how you could take advantage of this. So you, there's a function called WP cache get, and this is called the cache API. It's going to check this for this post. So say thing ID is a post ID, and we're gonna say, hey, is this in the cache? If it's not, or if it is, we're gonna just return what's in the cache. And if it isn't, we're gonna do our expensive database query, or we're going to um, you know, do some heavy calculations and come up with the answer. Then we're going to set the cache, and then we'll return it. So then the next time that this is needed on this page load, it will, it will already be calculated and we'll have to do it over again. Um, so say you have a custom database table and you store uh, conversions or you, you have a form plugin that stores all of your entries. Um, you, you could use this and you could cache every entry as it's needed and then even if you're listing them in different categories in different buckets, you, you wouldn't have to get those again. So this is great. So again, WordPress does this out of the box. The second type uh, requires a little bit more work. This is called persistent caching. Uh, persistent caching, like I said, will persist to other people. So if user A goes to the site and looks at post A, B, and C, uh, and then user B goes and looks at A, B, and C, those will already be in the cache. So they won't have to go to the database. They won't have to get them. The, and then over time, the cache pool fills up and pretty much no database calls are being made unless the cache has expired. So you have a site and uh, you know it's, it's really great and it's on the Ellen DeGeneres show and all of a sudden everybody's going to your website and you would think, oh no, my site's gonna crash. But if you have caching set up correctly, you can actually absorb many, many users at once because you're not, you're not crushing your database. It's all coming from that, that, that uh, caching layer. And WordPress has a few of these built in as well. Um, the most common one you'll see is transients. Transients are time-based. So a transient is like checking the weather. Uh, I might, in the morning, I might wake up and look at my phone and see, oh, the weather is nice today. Uh, but I shouldn't wake up the next day and use that same forecast. I should check it again. So all transients have a date, uh, a timestamp that it'll expire, and then it has a name and then the data if it's, it hasn't expired. So with this example, this would be basically, um, say you're, you're grabbing posts from, uh, from a, a video game website with, uh, with some YouTube videos, right? You want to get those videos, you want to display them on your site. Uh, you wouldn't want to hit that every single time somebody loads your website. 
you get again you go on Ellen and you do you're doing really good and all of a sudden a million people come to your website you would also take that other person's site down and so it's not really playing nice if you use transients you can get that list that you need cache it and then say oh only check it every three days because I know that that's how often they publish content or check it every day just to be sure we have the latest and again this is really easy to take advantage of uh, basically, you would check the transient, you would say get transient, and then your transient name. If there is data, it, you just return it. Otherwise, you're going to make your external request or do your, um, your calculation. And then, if, as long as you don't get an error back, you're going to set the transient and then return the data. Super easy. And this is what it will equate to in the database. Uh, it, this is persistent, but it doesn't require additional setup or hardware. This is like, like non-persistent caching. This is built into WordPress. Um, if you don't have something set up to, to handle caching, uh, it's going to just store it in the database. So it will result in a database call, but it's still a form of caching. Uh, but basically there will be two entries, one for when it expires, and then one for the data itself. Um, so remember this guy right here, WP Object Cache? It's built in, it's non-persistent, but if you set up your server to be um, compatible with, with persistent caching, this will seamlessly hook into, uh, into that, that software. So an example is Memcache or APC, uh, Alternative Page Caching, Redis. There's a bunch of them out there. And this, like I said, this will uh, automatically go in there. Uh, basically, you need, uh, there would be something called a drop-in, and this will override the cache API functions. You can see this is WP cache add, which is one of the functions we had in our other example. Uh, basically, this will load before WordPress's versions of this load, and it will override it and store it into that caching layer. Um, and again, this, this requires no extra work. So, with memcached on that same website that had 45 queries, the second page load with 20 posts on it only resulted in nine queries. That was an 80% further increase, uh, further decrease in the number of total queries. So remember this guy, now he's on the phone, he's saying, hey, what's this caching stuff? Let's take advantage of this. And this is the exact same code example I showed before with the non-persistent caching. Uh, because we're using a drop-in and we have a different software layer in there of, of memcache or Redis, this you can use the same code example and no matter what server environment your your customers are using uh, it will it'll, it's a drop-in replacement so you don't have to worry about a thing remember transients transients are stored in the object cache when it's configured so again you can have transients and if the server is not configured with memcache or Redis, uh it will get stored in the database but if the, those things are present and it, which are more performant uh, it will automatically go into those. So no extra work, the same code will work for both. And uh, again, if, you're, if your customer has a higher performance site, a uh, higher traffic site, and they, they're implementing these other advanced concepts, uh, you don't have to do anything extra to support them. Which is great because WordPress, uh, WordPress covers so many different kinds of sites. Everybody from Time to CNN to you know, my personal blog, we, we all use WordPress for different things. And it's great to know that you can write a plugin or a theme that can take advantage of these things and then progressively would get better and better depending on uh, the person's level of traffic and the, the amount of uh, software they put into it. Page caching is another form of persistent caching. Um, does anybody know, who knows like Apache and Nginx? Yeah, so that's basically the layer before the, the web server and it, Direct, it's kind of like the air traffic controller in your web server. Um, there's something called Nginx Plus, N, yeah, Nginx Plus, Nginx Plus, or Varnish. Um, so this is basically like cooking the food and having the leftovers in the fridge. So you had all the ingredients and you, you make the recipe, you put it away, and what this will do is it will cache the entire page. So you go to the home page, it's going to take that that whatever's output and what's finished and then that's what gets cached and the next time someone comes to the site instead of booting up WordPress and initializing and, and loading WordPress which is it, it can be uh, resource intensive it's gonna serve that static asset to the to the user um, 
So again, it, it, it's kind of that other layer. It would be one request. There wouldn't be any database requests or anything like that associated with it because it's basically a non-dynamic version. Uh, this is just an example of uh, basic Nginx uh, configuration of some, some way you could take advantage of this. But it's really easy. You just have to install Varnish and then get it configured. I say it's easy, but it's really not. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it can get complicated. Uh, but this, this becomes a little problematic because uh, what if you're on, for example, uh, an e-commerce site? Maybe you have a shopping cart. So we're going to talk about something called partial page caching. So take a look at this example. This is just a basic test site. Um, and try to think about what, what parts of this page you would not want to be cached for everybody. Okay, you have it in your head? Ready? Ah, so we have at the top, we have a My Account link, and we also have a shopping cart, where it shows uh, a dollar amount for what you have in your cart, a number of items. But if I go to that website and I add a couple things to my cart, and the page gets cached, I don't want the next person to have the same things in their cart. I want them to have a fresh cart that's unique to them. Uh, their account link is unique to them. We shouldn't be caching that. And that introduces something called uh, hole punch cache or partial page cache where you would identify parts or templates within your site that would not go through the cache. Those would be basically blank in, in the eyes of the, the caching mechanism. So yeah, so if you have e-commerce or dynamic aspects, that's something you would want uh, to use. Another way to get around this is to use JavaScript to populate this. Uh, so when the page loads, it might make an external request to uh, through Ajax to get that customer's uh, cookie ID, whatever, in their, their browser, and then specifically request that person's data uh, and, and change the page to display that. There's also opcode caching. Opcode caching is, uh, it, it's, it's put into the uh, execution lifecycle of PHP, and the caching is done on the compilation result. So when PHP starts up, it does all this stuff to compile and get ready to run, uh, and it once that finishes, it takes that result and then it caches it. So it eliminates that startup level of, uh, of loading that, that happens at every request. Usually out of the box, this is up to a three times performance benefit, just installing it and setting it up. Um, a lot of hosts have this by default and uh, you, they, you, you might be taking advantage of it, you might not even know. Who's gotten bit by browser caching before? Are right, you ever having trouble with a site and there's, well, did you clear your cache? You tried a different browser. Uh, so this is, this would be basically like you go to the grocery store and you get the, the jug of milk and it says only use this jug of milk until next, next Friday. Uh, when, when your site, when, when a user requests assets from your site like CSS, JavaScript, or images, they're accompanied with an expiration header that says when the browser should expect or should re-request that asset. So this is basically so that, you know, that one megabyte background image is not getting loaded every single time for every, every page load. Um, and this is really easy to set up. This is uh, in Apache. Basically, you would say what types of file. You would set the cache control and the max age. Um, and I think this is for three years uh, for JPEGs. And... Um, can't remember, I think this is like a year for, for CSS. Okay. Time is hard, I forget. I did my math for today. Um, but yeah, this is, this is another thing that's really easy to set up. If you use something like Cloudflare, uh, it'll do it on the DNS level for you, and you don't have to really worry about it. Uh, but you're, most of the time your JPEGs don't change. Once the JPEG is there, uh, you're not going to re-upload over that JPEG. So why would you make your customers wait for it to get downloaded again? You know, set that, usually you can set that really high, like two or three years, and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but again, the only downfall is when you do need to replace that image, it would need to be a unique URL so that you can guarantee that the next person, uh, when, when the next person comes, even if they've been to your site before, they're getting a fresh resource. CSS, you change your CSS, your JavaScript, same thing applies there. All right, so I'm going to do some tips, and I guess some time for your questions. I know you all have caching questions. Caching is not your savior. Um, you should not be just building your website and bolting things on and expect to, at the end, 
be able to put caching in place and your site will be like laser quick. Um, that's not how it works. You, you should always be designing your application and your website to be uh, performant and only doing what it needs to do at the, at the right times. Um, it, and it will affect how you store your data. All these things are things that you should be thinking about. Sometimes your caching won't, you won't even need caching if you design your site well enough. Uh, you, you won't even need to do caching and the caching will just be the difference between a half second and you know a quarter second, which is great. Always assume the cache is 100% broken or empty. Uh, cache uh, entries can get evicted at any time. Uh, if the memcache server is restarted, it's completely empty. There's no data in there. Um, they also ex can expire. Uh, when you do WP cache add, you can set an expiration time. Uh, so that's another way that it could just disappear on you. So you should always have code that's in there defensively that will rehydrate the cache or re-get the data, even if you know the memcache server is offline. For that reason, you should test with and without caching. Um, it's always good to. Uh, I, I always try to build things without cache and then the cache is kind of that afterthought of um, okay now let's put it on we, we know we want to cache eventually but as long as we're following good principles and good practices the caching should come really easily at the end we should cache reusable things um, so take the example of I have a page that has 20 posts on it um, if I cache the list of posts then I can't really reuse that unless I need that specific list of posts again. But if I go through and I cache the post object for every post in that list, and then at the bottom of the page I have a list of the latest posts, I can reuse that post in that other section. Um, so there are times where you would want to you would want to cache groups of things, but if you're caching things at a more uh, at a smaller scale, the the cache becomes more useful. Um, it saves you size. It saves you uh, you know, you, you need less hardware on your cache because um, your, your cache server won't need to store as many things. And, you know, you might end up having, if you do groups of things, you'll have the same posts in there 20, 30, 40, 50 times, and you don't really need that, so. Uh, always bust or flush your cache. This is what I talked about before, where when you put a new image up or you put a new version of your CSS file, um, the easy way to do that is, uh, this is how you register a script in WordPress. You give it a name, you tell WordPress where it is, and you give it a version. So the easiest way to do this is to just change that version. Uh, so in themes or plugins, the, the best way to do this is to just make it match the version of your plugin. You can have a constant that's, you know, you change when you release a new version, and then all of these will automatically, uh, automatically change. Um, for example, this is uh, a this is the dash icon style sheet in WordPress core. In WordPress core, all the WordPress related style sheets that are part of WordPress itself will automatically get this version. Um, this is what it would look like. So even if you define a version on your asset, it would look like this. But WordPress by default will use the current version of WordPress that you're running and append it to every, every script. So when you update to WordPress 5.2.1, which should be out tomorrow, um, it will change in, in your, the output of your, of your pages and all of your users will get the newest version of that asset. They, you, you don't even have to do anything, it, it will automatically happen. Um, but if we did not do that, then you would be telling your customers, clear your cache, try a different browser, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this, again, this is a very easy way that's built into WordPress to uh, ensure that your, your style sheets and JavaScripts are getting updated. Um, should you warm or prime your caches? So uh, basically this, what this does is you might have something like a cron or a script that will uh, load your site and if the cache is empty, certain things are missing from the cache because they got deleted or your cache got restarted or whatever, uh, it will automatically put them in there. And it does it on its own without a user uh, initializing the process. So the first time the user goes, this stuff's already gonna be in the cache. Um, Sometimes this is really useful, especially if you're expecting, uh, you know, maybe you have a, um, let's say you have an email blast going out at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Uh, you want your site to be ready. So maybe you have a bot that just goes through and it caches your top 
five thousand posts in in the cache, and then when that when that goes out, you can run this at say eight forty five, and you're ready. You're ready for that traffic influx. Um, but when it all comes down to is every site is different, and there's no way to just set up the cache and expect it to work. Um, you're going to want to do a lot of trial and error with things. Uh, you, you'll notice issues with how you store your data. Oh, maybe this would be more efficient because then we could cache it like this instead. Um, and this is this is something that a lot of people get frustrated with because uh, WordPress's pitch is it's very easy, but it can be very complicated. And people go in and they go to the WordPress plugin directory and they say, "Oh, caching plugin! I want to put that on my site. I want to make my site faster." Um, but then it just it doesn't work and it makes their site slower. Um, reasons that can happen is, uh, so say you have a personal blog and by default, the caching plugin only caches things for five minutes. So if you don't get a lot of traffic, every visit to your site is going to be an empty cache, right? So if you don't get a lot of traffic, maybe your cache should be a day or 12 hours. Um, and so you, you got to really toy with these things and, and, and tweak them and, and try out and find what works best for you. Um, that's the, I think that's the main point of frustration I always see with caching is I tried all that it doesn't work but you know there's there's more to it than that you have to look at what's going on what are your user behaviors what's what's happening here um, this is this is some more further reading I'll have this this is on my website so you can come and find this uh, Zach Tolman has a great breakdown uh, goes a, more in depth on a technical aspect of what everything I've talked about. Um, you can always read the manuals, PHP opcode cache and memcache are the probably your more popular ones. And so when this guy is reaching out there, we wanna we wanna implement our caching and get caching checks. There you go. Be like this guy. This guy had a good good caching experience. So yeah. Everybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, if you are not technical and you don't write code, how can you make sure that uh, your site isn't compromising in speed? Um, so there's plenty of managed hosting solutions out there. Um, so for example, at Bluehost, we have a, a package that is, we do all that stuff for you. We, we manage that. Uh, so it's finding the right hosting uh, service that does what you need for your business, for your traffic. Um, that's one way you can hire someone and uh, they can set it up so that uh, you know you they can train you so this is how you restart your cash it's all set up for this if you need help we're on call type of thing uh, it depends on what level of support you need uh, but most most hosts will do some type of caching configuration for you and you, you just won't even know about it because they're just doing what's best for their clients but again, every site is different. So they might be doing something that works for 95% of their sites, but you might be on the 5% that that doesn't quite work for what you're doing and, and the traffic patterns that you have. Yeah. Yes, we'll go. Yeah. Um, do you have or know of or recommend any tools for determining performance of cash? What's working, what's not working? Yeah, so. Uh, the question was, do I have any tools that will um, show how the performance of cache is going? Um, ultimately, what matters is what your users see. So things like Google Page Speed Insights, um, those will be good things to use. Um, if you have, I can spin up my local, I can show you a couple things. Um, so this is just a local environment that I have set up. It's called Vagrants, Varying Vagrant Vagrants. It's a uh, WordPress development environment. Uh, but it comes with memcache installed. So um, when I'm working on a site, I can turn on memcache and I can see how it works. Um, but it comes with a dashboard. So 
this dashboard will show me exactly how many times the cache gets hit, how many times the data is coming from the database, and so on. Of course, live demos never go quickly. So when I come in here, I have a memcache admin. And so this is a dashboard that will tell me everything going on. So if I go to a couple sites, uh, it's going to tell me uh, how many, let's see here, oh, how many concurrent connections are going, how many total connections. Um, and the caching is not on right now, so it's not going to show anything. Uh, but once it's turned on, you put that drop in in your, in your WP content file uh, folder, you're going to start to see how many hits there are, how many misses there are. Um, and so that can help you whittle that down so that everything is cached or you can see, okay, what's not being cached and then no, we don't want to cache that ever. We always want it to be fresh. Um, so there's tools like this and there's some for Redis. There's, there's all different uh, versions for different types of caching. Yes, we have the Yep, you you had your hand up, right? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. How non persistent cache? Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate on how long this is going to actually persist. Because I was wondering if you could elaborate so you have a site that shows 50 posts on one page and then you have a, a thousand people doing that at once, you're going to fill up your memory really quickly. <clears throat> but if those are on, in uh, the cache, usually that's a different server uh, for persistent caching that will be serving that. And so it doesn't affect your, your service load. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah, so uh, when she runs the Google PageSpeed test, usually she doesn't do well on the caching static assets. Um, so that would be the, uh, the CSS stuff that we talked about, where, um, so that would be this, where you, your files don't have a max age set on them. So the max age would say, hey, you can use this until it gets three years old or until it gets one year old. Um, so implementing something like this would uh, allow the assets to be there on subsequent loads. So the first time it's got to get everything, but then once it's there, it can just reuse it from the, the memory of the browser on the, on the user's machine. Um, so ways you can implement that, um, services like Cloudflare, they have that. You can turn that on automatically. You can customize how, um, like I think on, on my site, I put it at like three years for my images because I don't, I don't change my images. My images are my images. Um, so it's things like that. There's some services out there you can use for that. Uh, you're talking WordPress.com, or uh, they probably they probably do have something like that set up. Uh, I'm not 100% familiar. He might be able to answer it for you later, because uh, yeah, he'll be more. <laughs> he knows the ins and outs a little bit better than me. A little better. Amy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I mean, that's essentially, it's, it's there to do things like that. Apache's there to do things like that. Uh, HD Access is basically Apache's configuration file. Um, we talked about Nginx. Uh, that's basically a different version of Apache. So. Um, so the question was, is that the best way to do it? Uh, yes. Uh, I use, I, I keep saying Cloudflare, but that's just what I use to do that type of stuff. And I like that because I can change server environments and I don't have to worry about Oh, now I'm using Apache versus Nginx. I have to, you know, get a new configuration that works. Um, it handles it on the DNS level for me. And if those caching headers aren't there uh, from the request itself, then Cloudflare automatically adds them. So I don't have to set that up. I don't have to worry about that. It just will work no matter what hosting environment I'm trying out. Yes. Did you create Fortnite? 
<laughs> I did not create Fortnite. That was the question. <laughs> I gave a talk in elementary school recently, and that was the number one question I was asked. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? No? All right. Next time we meet, I want to see you like this guy. I want one of those stacks. Thank you.